Thank you for joining me as we uh, continue with the tutorial for day two, Boulder 2022. Um, so I've gone in a fair bit of detail through a record through an ACE model with continuous data with twins. So what I'm going to do now is simply highlight what is different when we add in siblings and uh, so on when I change the parameterization for these scripts. So I'm just opening up the script here for ACE with siblings, it's continuous data. Uh, and we'll start by clearing the workspace so we can actually make sure that we don't pull any objects in that were um, used previously. And now we need to reload our data. So here's the first thing that changes is that we change the number of individuals here at this point here. And that means that these objects uh, are then, this, this change in terms of the number of individuals is propagated through the script. And these are the ways that we typically were specifying the dimensions of our matrices. And so when we add another individual in to our model, then we're changing the dimensions of our variance covariance structure, our matrices there. And we're changing the number of uh, dimensions of our means, expected means. So we need to make sure that all of our matrices in our script are the appropriate size, the kind of, the number of individuals and the number of traits that we're analyzing. So we still have only one trait, but we now have siblings as well, as a sibling as well as twins. So our sibling variable, for the phenotype was just called SIB, and then we've got age three and six three to incorporate those covariates for the siblings as well. And we can have a look at our data, and we can see that the covariance of the sibling with the MZ twins is approximately the same as the DZ twin covariation, which is what we'd expect when we've got simulated data. In practice, often we see that siblings are correlate a little bit lower. Um, which is then going to be a difference in terms of it might be a cohort effect, it might be an age effect, it might be uh, just the sibling environment effect. But um, in this case, they were exactly, they're simulated to be the same. So here is another point that is a little bit different. We, even though we um, populated the, the change in the size, of the matrices in order to incorporate the third individual, we need to make sure that we actually specify what the name of that variable is for our definition variable. So remember definition variables are going into our data and actually extracting relevant information row by row, column by column, as we specify it here using this label that says data dot. So we need to make sure that we go tell it which variable do we want it to get for sex and age for our sibling. This is all the same. And then we actually have to um, give our expected covariance matrix or variance covariance matrix, the extra column and the extra row for our sibling. So here with our MZ um, families, we are using the covariance of our DZ pairs because we're expecting our siblings to have the same type of variance covariance structure as our DZ pairs. So we don't need to create a different object with a different name that is exactly the same as the CDZ uh, matrix. We can just use that value here for the extra column and the extra row. And then our DZ uh, families are then going to have the same extra column, extra row for our siblings. Again, we have our data objects, our expectations. And then at this point here, because we included this matrix, so the CDZ matrix, which is an object that's called COVDZ, we had to ensure that that COVDZ object ended up in the MZ model because the MZ model that has this variance covariance um, matrix uses this object. So everything that this model requires needs to be listed here in this list of objects. And this time it requires this object that's called COVDZ because it's specifying what the siblings, are, how the siblings are covering with the MZ pairs. This is all the same. And then we run it. And here is our summary. 
So our intercept is a little bit different. Um, different ages, I think, because the, the, sex very, the sex effect is very similar. The age effect is a little bit different. This is all very similar, if not exactly the same. I can't exactly remember, but they look very similar to me. And let's do the power calc. And previously we had a power of 0.999. Essentially that's just bumped up to one. And previously for C, it was 0.62, I think. And now it's bumped up to 0.96. So a massive increase in the power to detect C when we added in siblings. So now we're going to actually specify um, the relationship uh, among our family members in a slightly different way than what we have done in the previous script. So I'm just going to load, clear the workspace, um, reload our power function, reload our data. This is now all the same. There's our covariances. And here we have the different specification. So whereas previously we, I'm just gonna flip back to the old script so you can compare and contrast. Previously we specified our covariant, our variance covariance matrix in this way. So we built up these, um, uh, built up our final matrix using other matrices. Now what we're doing is we're specifying a matrix that has the relationship, the expected relationship structure. And so this is, um, we can see here in T, so that's, we've got three individuals, it's gonna be a three by three column. Let's run it and I'll actually show you what that looks like. So this is the relationship matrix for our MZ uh, families. Uh, so even though it's, they're listed here all in a row, OpenMX is loading it by going um, like the row one, column one, row two, column one, row three, column one. And then because this is a symmetric matrix, it's just going to be low, it's going to be filling in that lower um, triangle, the lower left triangle. And so when we see these values here, and we compare them to how it looks when we actually look at that matrix, then this looks more familiar to us compared to what we've been doing. So we can see that this is the relationship with twin one with twin one, so that's the variance. This is the covariance between our NZ pairs in terms of their genetic relationship. And this is the genetic relationship between our NZ twin one and our sibling. And then if we run this for our DZ pairs and have a look at that, then we can see, oh, okay, so this is our variance on the diagonal. But this is the genetic relationship with oneself. This is the genetic relationship between DZ twin pairs. And this is the genetic relationship between uh, twin one and a sibling. And this is with twin two and a sibling. And then we can specify a matrix that is for the shared environment and one that is for the unique environment in a similar way. So our shared environment, everyone has the same shared environment based on this kind of family structure and the assumption that we're looking at those environmental influences that are 100% shared across the individuals in a family. And then this is our unique environment. So this is the influences that are only shared that are only relevant to an individual is not shared across individuals in a family. So we've got all of these four matrices and then we're gonna multiply them together. So this here is the matrix that holds the estimate for our variance component of A. This is what's being estimated. And we're gonna say, okay, take my individuals, my MZ uh, families and let's, multiply that out by A. So this is a Kronecker multiplication in matrix multiplication. And so it's going to create for us a um, variance covariance matrix that is three by three. That is the size that we want. 
that is going to describe the relationships, the expected relationships in among the family members of MZ pairs. And then we're going to do one that is the same for our DZs, although this time it's going to have, well, the only difference here is that the, the description of the genetic relationship here between our DZ pairs is different to our MZ pairs. Everything else is the same. And then we load some data objects. These are all the same as what we've done before. And here we build the final model and run the model. And let's have a look at the results. So again, this is exactly the same as what we just ran when we specified it using the way of building the variance covariance matrix with our objects versus creating a relationship matrix and using that to multiply out against our uh, estimated variance components. Actually, we can see here compared to the very first one with only um, twins that our C is uh, positive in terms of the lower bound. So that's consistent with having more power to detect C and run that yep and it's exactly the same so that is the one way and then we're going to build on that using zygosity as a definition variable so again clear the workspace so we we'll use this to do the covariance because we're now um, not going to need to specify MZs and DZs separately. We're going to use our definition variable to specify MZs and DZs differently. So previously, if I just flip back to the previous script at the top, we separated our data into MZs and DZs and we used the zygosity variable to do that. Actually, one thing to do that's useful is I have a look at what are the variables. So here's the zygosity variable that we use to separate our data into NZs and DZs. And then this zig t is going to be specifying the relationship between um, our MZ pairs and our DZ pairs. So one is going to be specifying our MZ pairs. Um, when we get down to our um, DZ pairs, which is the bottom of this data set, we can see that this has been specified as a 0.5. And then the genetic relationship of our um, siblings with our twins is just 0.5 the whole way. So we're going to use a definition variable. We're going to be pulling in that particular data row by row for our families at some point in the script in order to um, specify our different genetic relationships between our NZs and our DZ pairs. So expected means are all the same. And here is where we're doing that. So um, this is building on from that matrix that we created that describes in a hard-coded way across MZs and DZs what the genetic relationship was. Now we're having a single relationship A matrix. So it's going to be a single matrix that holds the information. But instead of actually going, I've got one that's for DZs and one that's for MZs, I'm actually going to have one matrix and pull the relevant family level data into that using a definition variable. So again, it's going to be false. We are then, as a definition variable, it's data dot. This is the name of the variable in our data set. And again, we're going to, it's a um, standard matrix. So this one actually has ones on the diagonal. And we're going to put this um, into the very first cell that's available to take uh, a label. And that's going to be um, row two, column one. Here, we'll just highlight that and have a look at it. Makes it easier. So here we have it. Um, so our values on the diagonal are one. And then this is the relationship between our twins. And then this is our relationship between twin one and our sibling. And this is our relationship between our twin two and our sibling. And they came from the columns of data where we specified that information. And then we're using 
our definition variable and then doing a Kronecker multiplication with our variance component of A that is going to be estimated. And that's what's going, and then we're summing all of these. So our A plus C plus E in order to get our three by three expected covariance. And it's only the one. So now because we're pulling in data row by row, family by family, and that's what's telling the model what is MZ and what is DZ, we don't need to create those two different submodels in this particular script. And so we're just pulling in our data, it's raw, and we've got our single ex expectation object, which is then describing our expected covariances and our expected means, pulling in our lists, and our final model where everything goes in and running it. And here is our output. And again, we've got a very similar looking intercept, similar sex and age effects, similar variance components for A, C and E. And we're, it's probably this, exactly the same because we're expecting it to be exactly the same. We're still at this point in time um, specifying like hard-coded the relationship, the genetic relationship between our NZ pairs is one and the genetic relationship between our DZ pairs is, is um, 0.5. So we're going to now take that use of a definition variable that was taking information row by row and we're going to use instead measured genetic relationship information and pull that in row by row so that we actually get that amount of variation, like not all DZ pairs are exactly 0.5. And so we're actually going to use that in our model. So clear the workspace, load our data. We can actually have a look at our um, distribution. So our data that is our genetic related relatedness data is called S1 for the relationship between twin one, twin two. So go back and have a look at that. These ones that are basically um, at one, they are our NZ pairs, and these ones that are about 0.5, they're our DZ pairs. Whereas S2 is relationship between twin one and the sibling, that should all be about 0.5, and S3 is twin two and the sibling, and that should all be about 0.5. We can also use this uh, split, like knowing that there's like this big gap in our S1 data, we can use that to split it into our um, MZ and DZ pairs and have a look at their covariances. And this is all the same. And here is where it's different. So instead of uh, specifying um, the relationship in a definition variable that is either coded one or 0.5, now we are pulling in the actual genetic relatedness um, measure between our twins. Again, definition variable, and this is the name of the variable. And again, it's a standard um, matrix. So ones are on the diagonal, and then we're loading that information down the columns. Um, and we've got our C, our E, we're putting them all together, data. And here is our output and we can see that they're similar. This one should be slightly different because it is using no longer hard-coded um, 0.5s for the DZs and for the siblings, but very similar, very similar. And run the power on that. So now we're going to have a look at what happens when we just run this model with DZs only. So we now have measured genetic relatedness. And so that gives us a little bit of vari variation in that um, A value that expected or well, the measured genetic relatedness among our family members. 
And so that gives us a little bit of room that we can maybe disentangle a little bit of A and C because C is a fixed value of one. And so instead of using uh, the relatedness between MZs and DZs, we're going to use the relatedness among our families as a like a continuous variable to disentangle um, A from C and try to pass our variance into A, C and E. And uh, so I'm going to start by loading up the data. Now we'll notice that already this is a different data set. So when we had MZs and DZs, then there's a considerable amount of difference between the expected genetic relatedness between MZs and DZs. And then when we measured it, it's between the measured genetic relatedness between MZs and DZs. So we had some fairly, um, pow it's fairly powerful to be able to disentangle those types of um, relationships. Now that we only have DZs, we don't have a lot of variability in our genetic relatedness. And so we're gonna need a lot more sample in order to get this model to converge okay. So we have a different data set simulated with the same sort of parameters, but it's got 10,000 DZ pairs and siblings in it. So this is all the same uh, as what we've done. There's our definition variables for our covariates. Here are our definition variables for our genetic relatedness. And there is our expectations, our model objects, our model, and I will probably pause the recording here because it's going to take a long time to run. Okay, so it's run now. Let's have a look at those results. So we can see pretty quickly that there is something substantially different now that we've dropped our MZs out. And we have, considering that the data was simulated to have an additive genetic variance of 0.5, um, we can see that it has not recaptured that at all well, giving us an estimate of 0.02. And part of that is around this difficulty with having only similarly related individuals um, in trying to disentangle the A and the C components of the variance. So when we're thinking about our expected relatedness in terms of our original models, then we have C is completely shared and A is half for DZs and, and one for MZs. Now we, we have measured so more variability around our DZs, but we've completely lost the MZ um, contribution to the relationship structure. And when we looked at the co-variation of our MZ pairs on this particular trait, we could see that they were around 0.75 or something like this. So they were substantially more similar to each other than the DZs and the siblings, which were around 0.4, um, 0.44, I think they were. So now we're looking at a very similar uh, co-variation in the trait. Um, yes, all of those individuals have some kind of shared environmental uh, factors that can uh, assume to be uh, equally contributing to their co-variation. And their genetic variability is only ranging from like 0 0.4 to 0 0.6, I think it is, in this, in this, mod, in this data. So to be able to disentangle what goes towards A and what goes towards C is, is um, going to be difficult given that where we don't have much variation and much differences in our individuals in order to work with that in that space and disentangle that. So we have um, not recaptured uh, any kind of representativeness of the actual data with this particular model, unfortunately. And if we have a look at the power, so when we have a look at the power, we can see that, interestingly enough, it, it's given us a, um, a power to detect C of nearly one, a power to detect A of uh, 0.1. 
And this is because the final model fit that um, was um, came from the optimization process really did land on the side that the var the covariation that was happening was due to C rather than due to A. And um, that means that we had very little loss in model fit when we dropped A from the final model. And that's how the power is being, being calculated in this post hoc sense. So we can see quite substantial differences in this final model where we dropped the MZ pairs compared to the previous models. I'm just gonna show you what they look like as a graph. So the blue here is the continuous variable with our twins only. We can see that we didn't have as much power for C as um, for A. And then we could, we tightened up those confidence intervals a bit with adding siblings. And essentially there's no change from adding the siblings with the original parameterization to the alternates using sargosity as definition variable to using measured genetic relatedness um, as a definition variable. And then we get a massive change when we add, when we have only DZ uh, pairs where the model really struggles to differentiate between the A and C. Now, this would be uh, better, it would be better able to do that if we had more varieties of genetic relatedness in our data. So if we had people who were expected to be only about a quarter related or people who were MZs, I mean, we can see that if we have more variety and more differentiation in terms of the degrees of relatedness, then we start to be able to crack into and um, use that information to pass our variants variation into genetic and environmental sources. So I hope that that's been useful and um, that the models are all running well for you. And I will uh, wish you all the very best in modeling with genetics and twins and families in the future. Thank you.